Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today I'm here with Alexa Figueres, who is a professional menswear tailor. And she is helping me with a very special project that I have been dreaming about for over 10, 15 years, creating a Halloween costume that I have for the rest of my life that is as historically accurate as possible. And we're just gonna dive in and nerd out. <laughs> So I've made friends by doing some very obscure hobbies and crafts and trades in my life. And I met Alexa through a curator at the, in the Met Museum who recommended her when I was asking about finding someone to draft a pattern for me for a historic costume. Alexa, where did you learn how to make clothes? Um, well, I went to school in London for costume making specifically, okay. so my passion is historical clothing and costumes. Mm -hmm. um, I started when I was about 12 years old and I've always loved theatre, so I got involved with the theatre at my high school and mm -hmm. it just grew into a love from there and I wanted to do it professionally, so that's what I did. And now <laughs> Alexa works at a studio, that's where we are right now, that makes costumes for Broadway. So we have designers come in from different productions and contract us out to make different costumes for them. So we won't necessarily make the entire cast. Um, we'll be hired for a couple of leads or a couple of the ensemble costumes, and then it gets passed down from our studio owner to the different stitchers and the different teams to work on. My introduction to historic clothing started when I was 12 years old too. I started volunteering at a historic site called Black Creek Pioneer Village in Toronto and I was given a costume which was a work shirt and a pair of trousers and because they used those costumes for campers and kids that were coming and going through the historic site it was disgusting. <laughs> It had pit stains in it that could not be washed out. I think my shirt was from the 1970s. It was polyester. Oof. It was it was just gross. <laughs> and after wearing that costume for a year, I was really motivated to figure out how to just make a version on my own. The costumer at the historic site was very generous with her time and she showed me how to make just a plain work shirt. So this isn't the first shirt that I made, but I made many over my 10 years of working at Black Creek. Amazing. And this is a, just a linen shirt, which these historic shirts, these work shirts are just basically squares and rectangles. This shirt front is a square. The uh, sleeve is a rectangle. There is a gusset here that's a square that turns into a triangle when it's folded. The collar is just a rectangle. The plackets are rectangles, and then the cuffs are rectangles, and the sleeve gets gathered into the cuff. So I really, I made my first shirt when I was about 13, 14 years old. I used my mom's industrial sewing machine in the basement that she used for sewing curtains, and then I, and I did all the finishing by hand. Making my first shirt and wearing it as a teenager gave me such a sense of accomplishment it feels like you really achieved something and it becomes addictive. I think like we have been nerding out for weeks about <laughs> this, um, uh, this common interest of historic clothing, but that's how it starts, right? Like you make one thing. Definitely, it gives you a new appreciation for garment workers and just what goes on your body and how much work it takes. Yeah. Do you remember the first thing you ever made? I do. Um, it was a very bad jacket. Um, it was single layer cotton and I used a McCall pattern yep. um, and I, I didn't know what bias tape was so I cut strips on the straight and mm -hmm. that didn't quite work the way I thought it would but um, I was very proud of it when I was 12. Yeah. Um, but it just grew from there to refining the skills and learning the vocabulary and learning what I needed to do to make something good and real. Yeah, and that's, that's how it happens. You make one thing and usually it's not that great but then you, you really learn and the, the thing about fabric is that you can turn it into something else if if you screw up. Definitely. So this was this was one of my shirts from Black Creek. I made about six or seven shirts over my career, my very illustrious career at Black Creek Pioneer Village. <laughs> and then there was one year that I attempted to do something a lot more complicated, which are trousers. Ooh. So trousers are not just rectangles and squares because 
they need to fit around your buttocks and your crotch. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that is a complicated thing. So these trousers have the button fly. They're not lined. Um, but when I made these, I, I felt like, okay, now I'm really doing something. I now had kind of a whole outfit. I had the, the, the trousers and the shirt, and I was fully clothed in uh, a costume that I had made by hand. And it just grew from there. Shirts, trousers, and then eventually I made a friend's wedding dress. And then after the wedding, I took the skirt because she wasn't going to wear this huge skirt, and I turned it into a a, an 1860s ball gown that is over here and <laughs> this has traveled with me all over the place and it has been worn by many 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 friends I, I have put tortured my my girlfriends by putting them in the corset first <laughs> they'll, they'll I can all tell you stories Caroline Corinne <laughs> uh, wearing the corset first so that they could fit in the bodice and then like, I'll be lacing them up and asking, is it okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. Yeah, it feels okay. It feels okay. And then two hours later, they're like, you have to get me out of this thing. Oh, I can't breathe. I'm going to faint. <laughs> so so this, this, this costume has been all over New York City on Halloween. I'm usually wearing something like this. And then um, one, of, one of the girls is, is wearing this. When we look at these clothes, especially historic clothes, and they're flat, it's very hard to tell how they come to life when they're being worn. And th this dress uh, is from the 1860s when they would have worn undergarments that shaped it. So the corset was very important to creating the shape that the bodice would go over. But then underneath the skirts, this huge bell-like skirt was created by an undergarment called a hoop skirt or a, crin a crinoline, crinoline <laughs> where there's actually metal wires. I'm just going to go and grab it. This is, this is the crinoline that I made. And so it's, it, it collapses. It's flat like this, but this is what, this is one of the key undergarments to wearing a dress like this. So I've been doing this for a long, 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 long time. It started with, with really, uh, being inspired by historic clothing and then it turned into actually making some modern garments like a jacket. Um, Alexa, <laughs> did you start with historic clothing too? I actually started with more costumes and um, I liked making costumes for Halloween and for Comic-Con for my friends, but um, the love of historic clothing really came from novels and TV shows, period dramas, mm -hmm. and um, nowadays I really like costumes that incorporate historical elements because it makes it feel more real and it brings it into the real world and into a past that's recognizable. Yeah, that's beautiful. We, we both, um, when we get together, we look at these, we look at <laughs> books and if, if you're at all inspired to start making your own clothing or you're inspired to even just try something that has any historic reference, there are some great books out there. This is one of them. It's called Historic Fashion in Detail. Or there's 19th century fashion in detail, and then there's 18th century fashion in detail. And there, it's just beautiful images of pieces from the Victoria and Albert collection. And there is a hoop skirting. Oh, oh. <laughs> there, is a, there is a dress that's very, very similar. similar to this one. So both Alexa and I, We've studied old garments in order to inform how we make the things that we're making. My dream of a Halloween costume that I wear every year for the rest of my life is a Tudor doublet and trunk hose. Something like if you think of Macbeth or Shakespeare, it's like that kind of costume. And when I decided that this was the next big Halloween costume that I, I wanted to make, it always starts with some historic research. So I went to the Met, I saw the Tudor show. Did you see that? Yes, I did. It was great. And <laughs> then I uh, met up with Marcy again, and we talked about some resources. And then the next thing that I always do is I love getting books. I love getting books, because then you can sit and you can really trust it's a lot harder to write a book than it is to write a blog post on the internet. Don't you agree? Definitely. Like, so, 
<laughs> so I feel like with anything historic, when you want accuracy and you want a, a reliable source, I always turn to books. And the, that book, we'll just thanks, Alexa. This book came out not too long ago. It's called 17th Century Men's Dress Patterns, and it was actually published by the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's fascinating because what they did is they took pieces from their collection, actual doublets and trunk hose, and they x-rayed them. They took very detailed photos of what was inside the garments, and then they had patterns drafted. The, the authors of the book actually drafted patterns of the actual pieces. This was such a valuable resource for me because it, it made me go, okay, finally, here we have it. The costume that I'm gonna make, it's going to be this one right here, a doublet and trunk hose from the year 1618. Now, because the pattern was in this book, and it wasn't a McCall's paper pattern that you, you buy and you cut out to your size, which is how both of us started to learn how to sew, is buying those cheap paper patterns, which are great. But because this was in a book, I didn't know how to take this and make a pattern that would fit me. That's where there was a standstill. Alexa was recommended to actually take the pattern in this book to measure me and create a pattern that would fit me. So we both love historic clothes. We both love dressing up uh, for fun whenever there's an excuse, right? I Absolutely. think you have a lot more excuses than I do, right? Maybe. I go to Comic-Con quite okay. often. <laughs> hey, that's, that's like a very big outlet. If you love to dress up and you love to make uh, clothing, Comic-Con is just a, such a wonderful place to be able to pour all your enthusiasm. Um, I don't. Do I? I should bring you to Comic-Con. You should. Yeah, <laughs> I'll come with you. But my, my outlet has always just been Halloween, and I've always used Halloween as an opportunity to really nerd out on making something historic, like historically inspired, and then wearing it, and it's, and it's once a year. So uh, I, I've worn my Halloween costumes into the ground. We actually, some friends and I, um, I don't know if I should say this publicly, but we snuck into Heidi Klum's Halloween party. Snuck in? Yeah, we showed up to the red carpet, and I was with two of my friends, and um, one of my friends pretended to be my assistant and said, oh, well, like this, his, his, his name is on the list, and, and they're like, oh, it isn't though. And then he, she was like, well, it's supposed to be, and she kept looking at our clothes. Like she kept actually looking at what we were wearing, <laughs> And Corinne was wearing this dress, and Seth was wearing this beautiful thing with a big lace collar that I'd also made. And finally she's like, okay, just go in. But, <laughs> but I feel like what the way we got in was the clothes. Definitely. So these things that we make, they sit flat, but really when you put them on, they just come to life. And that's the magic of doing this. There's, there's something about copying a piece of historic clothing and then putting it on and seeing it take shape. And it, Alexa has obliged us. She's going to put on this, this, and I want you to just have a good look at it now because it's totally flat. So this is what it looks like flat. And then um, Alexa, you'll bring it to life for us, please? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Historically for that ball gown, there would have been multiple other undergarments that a woman would have worn, a chemise, different petticoats, but the main shaping garments would have been a corset, and this beautiful corset Alexa made, and I'm gonna lace it up. So the corset is on, and then the next thing is putting on this crazy thing, mm -hmm. which you could step into, I think. This is the front. Yeah. Actually, is that the front? So, so this need this little flappy thing needs to go at the back. Oh, so yes. that's yes. I always get confused. That is the front. There we go. Yes. And I think, yeah, like that. And then that just gets. 
hooked. Look at that. Beautiful. So they, <laughs> look at how that already it changes. And it moves, like it moves, it, there's, there's such movement to it, which is like what little girls say, like, um, I'm a princess. Yeah, and, it, and that's the other thing too. They're like, how do you sit down or how do you move around? But because it's very thin metal, it, if you, to go through a narrow doorway, you would just walk through it. And the skirt, which now has to go over your head because you can't put it through the other way. There we go. Okay. I don't know if this could slip over your head. I think this is the way we've always put it on. Like just... Can you imagine like New York City at the time when this is what the streets were filled with? Huh. Like there was a time when this is what they wore. It's just sometimes I ride my bike around and you see the buildings from this era and you think, well, I think of these clothes and imagine what it was like to be walking down the street at that time. There, look at that. The dresses come to life. This is really the thrill and the magic of making historic clothing and then actually wearing it is you feel like you're transported to a different time. When I worked at Black Creek, and all of the interpreters put on their costumes and then went out into the buildings, it really, that's what added to this feeling of time travel. Like just the way that this dress moves, it's, it's just something from a bygone era. And um, making stuff like this is what motivates both of us to just keep, keep going and keep doing it and keep challenging ourselves to make more and more complicated things. Thanks, Alexa. Thank you. <laughs> this is beautiful. Okay. Oh, good. I'm glad you like it. I love playing dress up early. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect.